Let's bow our heads and let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment. We deem it a privilege to be gathered around this place in your house, joining virtually as well to listen to your word. Thank you for the ministry of your daughter who just taught us. As we open the pages of your word, give us insight. Give us understanding. Not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, and exalted. Not I, but Christ. Be seen, be known, and be heard. Not I, but Christ. In every look and action, not I, but Christ. In every thought and word, in Jesus' name, amen. I welcome you to session number two. Our theme for this one week or week long program or project is Hope for Families. The subheading is Build establish and flourish the basic preposition is simple there is hope for the family exclamation the question then is what framework what module what principle what method what approach can we use to bring hope to and for the families we do so by building the families, by establishing the families, and by flourishing the families. And the question then comes, how can we build? How can we establish? How can we cause our relationships and families to flourish? This is the reason we'll be gathering here every day until next week, Saturday by this time. Our subject for this hour is familiar, family, familiar, family fatalities, familiar, families, fatalities. The subheading is let's be real. In the morning, we looked at familiar, family failures. The subheading is let's be, it's about us. They appear to be similar. In fact, quite frankly, this was the real message I wanted to share in the morning. So we tweak it a little. You can call it the morning's version, the part two. But to give it a commercial heading, I re-christened it, captioned it, familiar family fatalities. Subheading, let's be real. As I always do, Slide 14. It was Jesus himself who said, If you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You can say a hearty amen out there. Nairobi Central, no? You can say a hearty amen out there. Amen. I can take this. I'll manage it. This is just day one. So we are warming up gradually. I want to make to you four promises. Promise number one, the Bible shall be the bedrock of our study. The reason is the Bible means what it says and says what it means. Promise number two, you are going to be enlightened irrespective of who you are promise number three you are going to be challenged to make the most important decision of your life and promise number four our lives your life and mine will never be the same familiar family fatalities subheading let's be real our brother theme hope for families build establish and flourish because we are just beginning, I want to again welcome our online viewers for joining us every day till next week, Saturday.
We will be meeting here in the evenings. Uh, about this time, is it 5.30? Every day is 5 o'clock. Okay, 5 o'clock every day. I'm talking about East African Thai. If you are joining from West Africa, that is going to be around 2 p.m. And if you're in Central Africa, that is about 4 p.m. And we welcome you to join us. We have seven to eight objectives for this sessions. You know, this is when we go to spiritual programs. Not many people want to think. It's not just about emotions. We are dealing with mental health, so we need to think. So I will be taking time and explaining why this project is relevant for you and for me as well. Number one, what will you benefit from this program? At the end of the program, or the program is destined or designed to help build Bible-based families on the principle of wisdom. Number two objective, this program is customized to assist individuals and family establish their families, their relationships on the principles of impeccable understanding. Third benefit, if you participate in this program, you will receive the tools uh, for your families that will aid you to have what I call an common, an increased flourishing. In other words, by the end of this program, families will be tools towards the path of unrelenting and uncommon increase. Your family will begin to flourish. Things begin to change. The fruit you desire to see in your relationship, they will be tangible and they will be real. Benefit number four, if you participate in this program, it will help you lead or it will aid lead families move from mere involvement to faithfully commit to with the Lord. By the end of the program, if couples come every night, you will notice at the end of the program, you will ask, you will tell yourself, my wife, my husband, my boyfriend, we need to do this God's way, no other way. We will commit to God. It will not be a struggle any longer. Benefit number five, if you don't miss any of the sessions, families are going to be supported to become the centers of obedience by choosing the law and his way, regardless of the prevailing, alluring options in the world. Many things are pushing families. Many families want to modulate after Hollywood, after uh, Hollywood, after Gollywood, after any wood, including any bush. But after, at the end of this program, families are going to be modulated after God's divine similitude and regardless of the alluring options in the world, you will say, yes, Lord, whatever, wherever, whenever. Benefit number six, for those participating in this spiritual seminar or lecture series or evangelistic meeting or revival is to provide tools for families to bond and to bind around truth towards deeper family introspection and candid spiritual audit. Where are we headed as a family? Many families don't know the tools to use to make or do audit, family audit. Many people are dating. They don't know how to measure the progress, the success threshold, the KPIs, the key performance indicators of their relationship. This project is going to aid you with the tools to do so. Benefit number seven. Young people who join will be prepared together with their will-be couples to transition into marital life based on deep information, not emotion, not pelvic attraction, but deep information. And lastly, this series is designed to reignite the families as the center of beauty and leave the institutional mandate conferred on her by the Lord himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to Familiar Family Fatalities. The subheading is Let's Be Real. This is our session number two. We are going to have eight sessions in all. So session number two. I made a preposition 
earlier today. That is, hopelessness accounts for broken lives, broken love, broken hearts, and broken homes. Whenever you see homes are broken, hearts are broken, love is broken, lives are broken, the basic thing underpinning it is broken hopes. When hope is broken, lives are broken. When hope is broken, love is broken. When hope is broken, hearts are broken. When hope is broken, homes are broken. When you study the Bible carefully, the Bible only mentions families 120 times. Only 120 times. But the family, the Bible makes reference to children, parents, husbands, wives, home, household, about 1,500 times. Let me say it differently. The Bible speaks a lot about the various variables within the family circles about 1,500 times. If you permit, I can boldly say the Bible is an inspired book for the family. It is a book for family, talking about children, talking about parents, talking about loved ones. This is the reason why families must be the priority. Ladies and gentlemen, our world is in crisis. The world is in agitation. Things are not working as they ought to be. And everybody is looking for answers. The Bible provides clear guidance, clear, di clear insight on the difficulties facing the world and the families today. I mentioned it earlier, allow me to state it for the purposes of emphasis. Why must you take family issues as a priority? Number one, the reason is the family is the assault center for the devil. You know it by experience. The family is the object of interest of the devil. The family is the nucleus for the church or of the church. The family is the foundation of the chair, the functional unit of the chair, the miniature of heaven on earth. The family, ladies and gentlemen, is the school for the soldiers of the cross. The family is the workshop for holy cosmetics, aroma for Christ. The family is the place where character is formed. It is on this premise the devil is against the family. Building the case for today, we agreed how is the devil delivering an unusual onslaught on the family. We agreed that sin was first introduced into the family. The first human betrayal took place between family members. We agreed today that death was first inflicted upon humanity within a family circle. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to say, favoritism is most destructive within the family. Jacob and Esau. It is in the family we see the most embarrassing immorality taking place. I'm giving you the Bible references. The most viral hatred spread within the family. Were we not told that Israel was forever divided because of family-related issues that were not resolved? Christ was rejected by his own family members. The church, which was a post-Pentecost church, was destroyed because of family fake family related issues ananias and Sapphira. if this is the case the big question what is the problem with the family i'm stating today my big idea the family's problem is 
or the family's fatalities or failures are occasioned by sin. Give it a thought. Everything that goes wrong in the family is premised on sin. Let me say it differently. The family's fatalities, the family's failures are all occasioned by sin. I want to make a case from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 to verse 20, write it down. You will not forget it for the rest of your life. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 to verse 20, we are going to glean some basic lesson from this text. The author or the writer is Paul. The author is the Holy Spirit, I should say. The Bible says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongue they have practiced deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Our subjects for this hour, familiar, family, fatalities, subheading, let's be real. There is so much hypocrisy in church. Every family is pretending all is well. When we dress, we come to church on Sabbath. Some of you joining us, you go to church on Sunday and everybody is seated, including some Muslim, some agnostic, some Buddhist, you, you name it. Everybody in public is showing up. I want to announce tonight as for me, I don't have a perfect family life. As for me, I am trying to build up my family. All is not well with myself, Samuela, Susan, and the rest of our household. Ladies and gentlemen, the crisis in the well is the crisis of the family. The crisis of the family is the crisis of sin. And we are coming to see it for this afternoon. In this short Bible study, and what the solution therefore is. Point number one, sin is a universal problem. Write it down. Never forget this for the rest of your life. Write it down. I'm going to play with some words. Make a note. You, you don't need to, you, you may need it to, to teach somewhere. Sin is a universal problem. Romans chapter 3 verse 9 to verse 10. Watch it very carefully. What then are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. I repeat, sin is a universal problem. 
How many people are not righteous according to the text? How many people are not righteous according to the text? There is none righteous. No, not even one. No pastor is righteous. Every pastor is having issues in their home. No elder, no conference president, no bishop, no general overseer. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is saying if there is a problem in the home, it is a problem of sin. If there is a problem in Kenya, it's a problem of the family. The reason why there is betrayal, there is envy, there is, there is murder, there is favoritism, there is stabbing at people at the bar, there is all manner of slanderous attitude is because of sin. But what is this thing we are calling sin affecting the family? Two young men and women met themselves and they said we love each other we want to live together and all of a sudden hell has broken loose at home something is wrong sin is a problem watch it very carefully this thing we call sin it infests all races look at the text very carefully verse 9 Sin is a universal problem. That's the big idea. But the subgetting is sin infests all race. Watch. What then are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and the Greeks. In that statement, Paul tells us that sin is a problem that affects both the Gentile and the Jews. And the Jews and the Greek is using to divide the then world. In those days, you are either a Jew or you are a Gentile. You are either an Israelite or you are a non-believer. You are not within the commonwealth of God. So in this statement, when the Bible says, both Jews and the Greeks, the Bible is calling the whole world. Sin has infested. It infests all the race. Either you are from the southern part of Kenya, the eastern part of Kenya, the northern part of Kenya, the western part, regardless your tribe, regardless your nationality, sin has affected your relationship one way or the other. The greed in your boyfriend is sin. The greed in your girlfriend. Some women are greedy to the bone. Look, some men, it's like they have plaster of Paris on their hands. They don't give. You see a nice young lady and she's all over you. My brother, just to give her, they would never give. They have P.O.P. plaster of Paris. You see, when people break their arms and they go to hospital, they need to put P.O.P. They can never stretch their hands to give. It's always, give me, give me, give me. What Was it two days ago? It was Valentine. My goodness. Some girls were alone. Not even... <laughs> I told my daughter, 10 things to see in a man before you marry her. Because she told me when she was nine, she had a crush on somebody. My heart. Eh, I nearly had heart attack. What? A crush? I drove her to the school and saw that boy she's having a crush on. And took the parents number and I came home to teach her 10 things a young lady must see I'll be sharing with the young women during this week when you see it in a guy red card flash him out like water closet anything you see some husbands they would just know it's it's they are domineering 
they are so opinionated nobody else think nobody else speak especially if they are choleric like tk Mensa. you are not careful they become demigods it's a matter of the heart issue sin how many rays is this affecting how many rays talk to me how many rays is affected all rays how many persons here are affected by that as well two hands of mine I am affected in any way, every way. How many persons here are affected by sin? Let me see your hand. Sometimes I'm thinking I'm speaking West African English. You're not getting me. Okay. Let me speak in Kenya English. Has sin affected you in one way or the other? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. That's the Kenya English. Okay. <laughs> now I know what to say now. Are you understanding me? Yes or no? Okay, this one is for, is for, uh, kissy, 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 <laughs> kissy. Sin affects all the races. So some girls will tell you, you know, I don't want to marry a black man. Black people don't think you are stupid. Whether a black or a white, the problem is not a race problem. The problem is what? A heart problem. Some people even think it is a religion problem. Look at verse 9 very carefully. Sin, it inflicts all religion, including Christianity, including Adventism. All religions are affected. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Regardless of religion, sin is affecting the problem. So whether the person, sin has affected all the race, every race is affected, every religion, the Greeks are affected, the Gentiles are affected. Everybody is affected. No one is left. And then the Bible says, it, it go to verse number 10. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. It infests all righteousness. So everybody is under the manipulation of sin. Whether in Islam, whether in Christianity, whether in Buddhism, whether in agnostic religion, you name it, everybody is affected. Ladies and gentlemen, for you to go and say, I am falling in love with somebody. No, he is not a saint. He is a sin infested, a sin dominated human being who is doing what we call packaging, packaging, packaging. As long as he's interested in the lady, he's a gentleman. He will open the door. He calls in the morning to check up on her. And she's having butterfly. And you see the women, they start behaving like charged electrons. If they are in the ninth sky. It's a matter of time. That's a scam. He's a sin-infested person. You see, the reason why people have broken hearts and broken homes is that they don't know how to manage expectations. And based on the information we received before we started marrying, before we started dating, our expectations were, as far as he's quoting the spirit of prophecy and he's wearing a suit, he's not like me, who is wearing a West African attire and shouting here in Nairobi Central, he's a good guy. Scam. Sin affects all race, all religion. All righteousness affected. Sin, in short, is a universal problem. Lesson number two concerning the subject of sin. So if everybody is affected with sin, as you are going into marriage, as you are going into a relationship, bear in mind, please minimize your expectation. The person is a sinner. If that is clear, somebody should say an amen. I did hear that. Somebody should say an amen. Sin is an ugly problem. Very ugly. Sin is very ugly. I'm referring to Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to verse 18. Watch it very carefully. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous. 
no not one so what i say is that watch it very carefully sin has soiled our spirits it's very ugly so sin it will evade your innocent soul and it will soil you i'm wearing a why sin can just throw death on me and i am soiled everybody in the world their soul is soiled they are, listen, sin has soiled. There is none righteous. Righteousness means doing right because it is right. Without any inducement. Doing the right thing regardless of who is watching. Nobody is doing that. The Bible says there is none righteous. In other words, sin has soiled our spirit. Somebody is now being cajoled by a young man somebody is now being deceived by a young lady ladies and gentlemen make no mistake manage your expectation that angel you claim you have seen and god himself has brought him to you and oh lord how excellent is your name scum he's a sinner he's a sinner he will break your heart it's a matter of time she will break you down she will leave you he will leave you first you need to budget for the shock that individual is not a saint we are not in heaven yet he is what a sinner she is what a sinner if that is clear somebody say a loud amen especially from the women mm -hmm. sin has soiled our spirit Watch it very carefully. I'm talking about sin. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. Human beings were created in God's image. True or false? Kenyans respond to me. Human beings were created in God's image. True or false? Now why is the Bible saying there is none who understands there is none who seeks after God what does it mean it says sin has soiled our senses number one we say it soils our spirit when it soils your spirit sin makes you not to think you behave stupid why will a married man spend all his earning on a tiny rabbit with a spaghetti top a full grown man is spending is is begging i i can't sleep until you call me his his senses are soiled he can't think she can't think ladies and gentlemen sin has not only soiled our spirit we are not searching after god number two we don't understand god so when god speaks nobody is moved when god speaks nobody trembles when god speaks nobody cares why the problem is sin why is my husband behaving like this no sin why is my wife behaving like jezebel sin after all, who chose her for you? You. You went to the market to choose a Jezebel. Stay with it. Pastor, I can't sleep my heart. I will die. 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 When it was time for the decision, you won't hear, oh, I can see. I know he loves me. You know, he's better than my ex-boyfriend. You see the women, they are all over the place. Even when they are 80 years, like Ellen White, they all would do it. Sin has soiled our senses. A man cannot spend his money fully on his family and his children and he's wasting it in frivolous expenses you can't understand is he mad yes why sin has soiled his senses watch the text very carefully 
They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Sin has not just soiled our spirit. It has not just soiled our senses. It has also soiled our soul. There is none who does good. No, not one. Sin. For the sake of time, their tongue, their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of apes or apes is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So I'm playing with sin has soiled our S S S S. Which one do you think this will be? Watch it very carefully again. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongues, they have practiced the seed. The poison of apes or apes is under their leaves, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So sin has soiled our speech. Why, why is he disrespecting me? The way he speaks to me, he doesn't respect me. No, sin. Why is she so disrespectful? This girl doesn't respect anybody. This woman, she doesn't respect me. She compares me with other men. Ladies and gentlemen, her problem is sin. Sometimes we jump from one sinner to the other in search of something that the sinner cannot offer or give. Only for us to be disillusioned. So somebody divorce and marry this one, divorce and marry that one, divorce and marry that one. And they get to a point and they say, you know what? I am tired. I'm tired of love. No, love is not the problem. Your problem is that you don't know it is sin. Expectations. Imagine a mother knows my child steals. And you receive a call. Hello, good morning, ma'am. We are sorry to tell you that we caught your child right now stealing a mobile phone in a shop. We are taking him to the police station. Please, we want to see you there in the next 10 minutes. Question, if you know your child is a thief, will you be shocked? Yes or no? No. Many of us are living in denial. Your husband is not a saint. Your wife is not a saint. Your wife and your husband, your boyfriend you are dating, they are sinners. Be very careful with your expectation. Please, may I not be misunderstood that I am saying, please, just be permissive for people. Don't hold people accountable. It's a journey. So if you use this session to judge the outcome of the presentation, you are going to be misguided. First things first, we are all called sinners. He can never do that. Who told you? Who, who told you? My husband, he can never kill. No, he can never kill. He cannot even touch a fly. Who told you? My wife, never. My wife can never cheat on me. Eh? 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 If they do paternity tests, churches will close down. It is in God's wisdom that we don't know some things. Somebody say amen. amen. Stop speaking in absolute terms. Your husband is a sinner. Your wife is a sinner. Is he or she susceptible to sin? Yes or no? Yes. Do we wish they do the right thing, including ourselves? Yes. Sometimes you are even surprised with yourself. Some things you do, you tell, I'm tired of myself. You see Paul make that statement. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to say, today parents lie, children lie, teachers lie, civil servants lie, private sectors they lie, politicians lie, pastors lie, Prophets lie, imams lie, shrines lie, 
occult lie everybody lies why the bible says they are tongues they have practiced war deceits sin has soiled not just our soul not just our spirit sin has soiled not just our senses it has also soiled our speech not only has sin blunted our minds and bruised our spirit it has also damaged our vessels our subject for this evening i'm talking about familiar families fatalities ladies and gentlemen let's be all real there is too much hypocrisy and duplicity sin has soiled our spirit sin has soiled our senses sin has soiled our souls sin has soiled our speech and look at verse 15 they are fit as swift to shed blood distractions and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known they are fit as swift to shed blood Distractions and misery are in their way, and the way of peace they have not known. In other words, sin has soiled our steps. It has soiled our spirits. It has soiled our senses. It has soiled our souls. It has soiled our speech. It has soiled our steps why is he behaving this way why is he not honest and genuine and frank why can't he tell the truth and do the right thing ladies and gentlemen sin has altered and soiled his steps and his steps you are worried about your adolescent child and you are thinking why is he we didn't train him this way we didn't do it this way lord what is happening ladies and gentlemen your son needs god he needs the converting power of the holy spirit nothing you can do about it until god resides in the heart your expectations on your wife your expectations on your husband your expectation on your boyfriend your expectation on your relationship ladies and gentlemen you will not be satisfied you will not be happy why Sin has soiled everything. Familiar, family, fatalities. Guys, let's be real. This is the practicality of the gospel. You see, when we come to church and we are saying, Have I known where burdens are lifted up? We cry and pray and pray. The problem is sin is dealing with us. The same way we are praying for others like that, we are also hurting somebody because sin has soiled our spirit. It has soiled our senses. It has soiled our soul. It has soiled our speech. It has soiled our steps. So someone is also hurt by the way I carry myself as God so take him and sir. Sin. Number one, we say sin is a universal problem. Number two, we say sin is an ugly problem. And, and, and I enumerated that. I, I want to go to, uh, 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 there is a point. Look at, the Bible says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Sin has soiled our sight. You see a young man, you see a young lady, she says, I want to marry him and an old woman. Says, ah, can she see? No. Sin has soiled her eyes no wonder the psalmist said open my eyes that i might see 
wondrous things out of your law. Sin will blind you until you make the wrong decision and it will stay with you for the rest of your life. Why can't she see sin has blinded her? Sometimes you need to just pray for your spouse. There is little you can do and you are asking, dear Lord, why is he behaving this way? Why is she behaving this way? There is nothing you can do. Sin has soiled his or her sight. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Though the angel in Revelation 14 verse 7 says, Fear God and give him glory. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. While this message is blaring, somebody is eating around the ashes of sea. You are wondering, can't she see? Can't you see? Doom, destruction is coming. Sin has blinded them. They can't see. Sin is a universal problem. Sin is an ugly problem. And I've given seven points under the ugly problem for the sake of time. Sin is an undeniable problem. It's not just a universal problem. It's not just an ugly problem. It's an undeniable problem. Look at verse 19 of Romans chapter 3. Ladies and gentlemen, when you are reading the Bible, you see, don't make the Bible like until we go to heaven before we understand. We need to, you see, present truth must be, must be applicable to our present lives. Don't take it too high. Let it relate to how we can live here before we go to heaven. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So there are some three, four, five points. For the sake of time, I want to run through it. Number one, our sin is declared by the law. Sin is declared. So when you want to say, sin is the reason why my husband is doing this way, how do you know what he's doing is wrong? You must get to the law. It says, it says the law, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So our sin is declared by the law. How do we know something is a sin? By the law. Our sin is declared by the law. Ladies and gentlemen, sin does some one, two, three, four, five things. Write them down. Sin will do five things eventually. See, we can pretend every marriage that has not overcome the sin problem and the problem is simple the solution is very simple but if we don't go through this solution guess what these five things are inevitable number one write it down sin sin deceives hey sin would deceive you it will give you a certain state of fantasy so i can be following someone's wife and guess what I am enjoying the run. Oh, oh, I am in a state of deception. Sin. Because it soils, you know, all the SS we deal with. The eventual physical impact is that sin, it misleads you. It can play you like, like, like a gross soccer. It will pass like this, pass like this. It will be moving you. Sin would deceive you. You think you are in love, you are in lust. You think you are enjoying, you know, uh, he is someone's husband, but I want to live a soft life. You know, I don't want to suffer. I want to live a soft life. Don't worry, sin will deceive. The question is this, who is being deceived by sin? The sinner. How many persons are sinners? How many races are seen, I am seeing? Oh. How many religion? Oh. How many righteousness? Oh. Sin deceives. Number two, sin disappoints. There are all these five Ds. Sin will not just deceive, sin will disappoint. 
So the Bible says, don't have sex before marriage. But when we are having sex before marriage, the meaning we give to it is that, listen, let me say it this way. A young lady is comfortable to sleep with a man before they marry. The man can disobey God. With you, you are okay. Now that you have married him, he must not cheat on you. Why? I'm the wife. Are you, are you superior to God? Wait. When he was dating you, you were dishonoring God. Yes, true or false? True. Now he is married. All of a sudden, he must obey God. Says who? Are you delusional? We need to take them to a psychiatric hospital. Ah, what is the meaning of this? We are dating. God says, don't fornicate. That one, we will not obey. Now we transition, we are married. The same God says, don't commit adultery. Now the woman is saying, you must not commit adultery. Am I not your wife? Am I not your wife? <laughs> but you were the girlfriend and you were disobeying God with him. Are you mad? Sin? You see the way it has deceived you? It has deceived you when you think that guy is a correct guy. Now you are married to him. Now he has played you left like a goalkeeper. Pa, you jump here. The ball has passed here. So sin will deceive. When it deceives you, you make a commitment. Then it will disappoint you. Now you are married. And she says, you know what? I'm not interested in this whole thing again. And a whole full grown man Full grown man. The men they don't they don't they don't cry when you are there. They will go and hide. Sin deceives. After seeing the progression, it will deceive. After you buy into its agenda or propaganda, then it disappoints. After it has disappointed you. You are still saying, please, I want it. I still love it. I want it. Then you notice that it has dominated you. Sin deceives. From deception, it disappoints. After disappointing, it dominates. It's addictive. So you want to leave. I can't leave. You want to stop. I can't stop. What is happening to me? No. Sin. This is the way sin operates. It deceives, it disappoints, it dominates. And after it, when it reaches the stage of domination, here is the next D, it disgraces. It disgraces people, it will disgrace you. After it has made you a public embarrassment, then it leads you to the next stage, it destroys. My time is up. Ladies and gentlemen, sin has enslaved the human race through deception, through disappointment, through domineering framework, through shame, disgrace, embarrassment, and through destruction. No wonder Paul says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Sin. Let me read three quotes and we pray. Three quotes. Take a screenshot of this quote and keep them. Put them on your status. I want you to read it with me. It's a quote on sin. Let's go. It says what? Sin takes you where you don't want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. It costs you more than you want to pay. Let's read it again. Let's go. Sin. No, let's pause. I think, I think Nairobi Central, you are educated, so you read with me. Let's go. Takes you where you don't want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. It costs you more than you want to pay. Who believes this? Let me see your hand. If you don't believe, it's a matter of time. A.W. Tozer, second quote. A man by his sin may waste himself, 
or in this context herself, which is to waste that which on earth is most like God. This is man's greatest tragedy and God's heaviest dream. When God wakes up in the morning and night falls and you call God, hello God, how are you? I'm not fine. What is the problem? I created them in my image. A man by his sin may waste himself, which is to waste that which on earth is like God. The only thing on earth like God is a human being. And whenever we are wasting ourselves with sin, it is our greatest tragedy. But that tragedy is God's heaviest word, greed. If ever God will weep, it's because of sin. Jenny Sanford says, remember, you may choose your sin, but you cannot choose the consequences. You may choose your sin, but you cannot choose your consequences. In the words of Ellen White, Patriots and Prophets, no, Review and Herald, Mark 22, 1887. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. Satan's happiest approach is for us to be indifferent to sin. If I were to have time, I would have looked at the sinner and the leper, the parallels and the implication for the marriages today. But we'll look at that tomorrow. The sinner, if you see the sinner's condition, you just suppose it with a leper. You see the lessons from the book of Leviticus. You see what God has said about leprosy and sin. Listen, one of the reasons, the chief reason why marriages are struggling is sin. This evening, I want us to sing a simple song and pray a simple prayer. The song I want us to sing, the, the, the gentleman following me, please, it's on the hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. It's 230, as a slide, 230. Look, the gospel is very simple. How many persons in this room are married? If you're married, please let me see your hand. Please, hands down. How many persons in this room are not yet married? Let me see your hand. Your case will be better than those of us who are married. Do you know the reason? Not many places did they tell us these realities in this manner. Many parents Many uncles and elder brothers and sisters, they made marital decisions before they are getting to know some of these things. It is your privilege. I want us to sing the song. We are singing all the stanzas. Please don't sing it with just your lips. Sing it with the heart. The problem of sin is in a person. I'll deal with that extensively tomorrow. You see, the family's problem is first to come to a realization. My wife is called Samwala. Samwala cannot give me the joy I desire. Samwala is a human being. To Samwala, God's will is a man before they call him of God. So a man of God is not God. He is a man before of God. So God will give us so much pain. 
Gospel will give us so much stress. Gospel will give us so much frustration. Her security is for this husband called God's will to daily surrender to Jesus and have power over sin. Then she will find peace. She will find joy. So that when we quarrel, it won't take me two months to resolve it. When I'm angry, the butterflies will not be murdered in the house. They will be alive for God's glory. It takes surrendering to Jesus. I want to ask this evening, not for your spouse, just for this week. Somebody wants to say, I want to attempt to be like a Christian just this week. I want to do the things Jesus will want me to do as a human being. I have a girlfriend, but I want to treat her like a human being, as God will expect. I want to talk to my wife like a human being, like I would like to be talked to. I want to speak to my parents like a son or a daughter. I just want to be a Christian. For this week, I want to say, God, just help me that I will be victorious over sin. I want to try that this week whilst I'm in Nairobi. Is there somebody like that who also want to try that? I just want to see your hand. It's, it's not, it's not, you see, we don't need to make Christianity so complex. Please, hands down. Those of you joining online, you are just saying, please, for this week, I will be nice. I want to surrender to Jesus so that I will act in a way that is in keeping with a Christian. I don't want sin to disgrace me. I don't want sin to disappoint me. I don't want it to dominate me. I don't want it to mislead me. I don't want, I want to surrender to God. I want you to join me as we sing this song. On a hill far away. Let's sing it. We are seated. Let's go. Please sing it like Kenyans, all right? On a hill this is a good one. Away, stood an cross. I like the way you sing it. The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best. For a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will clean. Change it someday for a We we'll sing the second stanza. Oh, that old rugged cross. Oh, that old rugged cross. Come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. So despised by the world. Has a wondrous attraction a for me. Wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above. For the dear of God left his glory above to bear into dark, to dark Calvary so I will cherish the old rugged cross so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies are Last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Rugged cross. And exchange it some. We want to save the last stanza. This is the deal we want to make today. This is the deal we want to make today. They'll be humming that. We want to sing the last stanza. Tonight, when you get home, 
if there is somebody either a child or a parent or a friend or a spouse you have hurt maybe because of your anger because of revenge you just want to take the phone and tell them I'm sorry the reason you want to do it as you want to do it because that is what Jesus did we call it the ministry of reconciliation some of you you have had boyfriends you broke up and you are still bitter and some young men you have treated some girls you would never want your sister or your daughter to be treated that way this this week you just pick up a phone in light of what we are going to be learning you tell them please I've forgiven you what you did I was hurt but I've forgiven you or you recognize you have hurt somebody you recognize that sometimes it's not what you really want to do is see put your pride aside and pick up a phone some of the men we have not treated our wives well be humble enough and just call her and tell her I have not dealt well with you I notice you are hurting I notice you are in pain I just want to ask for your forgiveness and you pray together with them is there somebody here who wants to attempt that you want to let go you also want to forgive others who might have hurt you after all all of us are sinners you hurt me somebody hurts you it's a cyclical game and we can only do that through the grace of God if this is your wish it's your desire please be upstanding as we sing the last stanza the third stanza mm -hmm. To the old ragged cross I will ever be true Each shame and reproach gladly bear Then he'll call me someday To my home far away Where his glory Just join in one line. We want you to join us in this prayer right now. I will cling to the old ragged cross. And exchange it someday for a crown. And exchange it someday for a crown. They'll be having that refrain for us. So I'll cherish the old ragged cross. Father in heaven, marriages are hurting. Even chicken relationships we have, boyfriend, girlfriends, fiancé and fiance, all these people are in pain. The baseline, this is not your intent. The intruder here is the cancer of sin. All of us are struggling with this cancer. Pastors, elders, church administrators, Christians, non-Christians, religious people, and non-religious people. This afternoon or evening, we recognize the problem is sin. It's deceiving us. It's dominating us. It's embarrassing and disgracing us. We pray today, we are on a trajectory of self-destruct. We pray for marriages here and those online. There are some women, they are hurting. They are hurting so deeply because they've been violated and left in the cold. 
there are some men who are bitter. Bitter because they were treated like ATM machines and thrown out. Some children are bitter with their parents. They are bitter with their fathers. They are bitter with their, with, with, with their mothers. They are bitter with their guardians or their benefactors. Some boyfriends are hurt. Some girlfriends are hurt. Every one of us, we have been deceived. We have been played by sin. And Satan has launched us against one another. Today, we confess we have been made fools. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the clarity. Thank you for the insight. We pray that this week, you give hope to our families, hope to our relationship. If there is anybody here who want to say, sin has played me for too long. I want to wake up from my slumber. I want to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. We have heard it many times in church. It seems too simplistic, but this is the basic remedy, the beginning of our solution to our family and marital unrest. We pray for help. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, may help be dispatched to somebody. May God draw closer to somebody. May angels minister to somebody. And we pray, may we find faith in Jesus. May we reject the alluring pleasures of sin, the lies, the deception. We renounce Satan and his sinful pathways today. Bless the young men. Bless the young women. Bless the married couples. Bless the would-be couples. Bless the widows. Bless the widowers. Bless the singles. Bless every category of social structure. For the next six days, seven days, we will study every night. We pray for illumination. We pray for your direction. Speak and give us understanding. Until we meet again tomorrow, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the God of hope dispense hope into every relationship and every life and every family. May it not be abstract. May it be tangible and real. And may this be our portion. For we have asked in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit we pray. Somebody say amen. God bless you.